welcome to episode 513 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. This is Monster Kid Radio, and I am your writer, host, producer, Derek M. Cook. Welcome to the podcast this week. This week, we're talking about a movie that was a first time watch for me, even though I didn't realize that going into it. We're going to be talking about the movie Supernatural from the early 30s, and we're going to be talking about that movie with friend of the show, Stephen D. Sullivan. So that's coming up here in this episode. Of course, that happens after a couple of our awesome segments that we've had sent in from other friends of the show, like Mark Matsky. He's providing another beta capsule review, and this one's important because we are getting so close to the end of his coverage of Ultra Q. But fear not, he assures me that he's going to continue with Ultra Man. And of course, we've got Kenny's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. That's going to be coming up here as well. And it is jam-packed full of information. And he even brings up a peplum film that I've never even heard of. But after looking it up on the internet and checking out a clip on YouTube, I'm dying to see it now because the monster looks amazing. So we've got all of that. But there's been some news this week, too, I'd like to go over. News in the form of the ballot for the 19th annual Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards. You can find out all about it over at RondoAward.com. This is the biggie. This is the Oscars, the Emmys, the Golden Globes, the I don't know what other awards I can think of, but this is the big deal. This is what all of us monster kids, all of us classic monster fans look forward to every year because this ballot works like a checklist. You can go down this ballot and look at best movie, best short, best magazine, best DVD, Blu-ray, commentary, website, multimedia, all of it, and treat it like a checklist of the best of the best of the previous year. It's also important to us here on Monster Kid Radio because, well, we've been nominated for best multimedia site. This is an incredible honor to have Monster Kid Radio gracing the ballot once again, or is it the other way around? The ballot is gracing us by allowing us to be on the ballot with a number of other amazing shows. Now, next week, I'm going to break down the ballot a little bit more, but I do want to say right now, if you go and check out the ballot, you're going to see a ton of friends of the show. People like Rod Barnett, people like Steve Turek, people, you know what? If I start naming names, I'm going to forget some. So I'm just going to stop right now because next week, like I said, I'm going to break down the ballot even more. Of course, between now and then, you can check out the ballot for yourself by going over to RondoAward.com. Highly encourage you to go check it out. And if nothing else, like I said, treat it like a checklist. Go down the list and make sure you got the best of the best of 2020. Because, I mean, really, 2020 was pretty much a rough year for everybody. If there's some good monster stuff in there, well, I mean, that might take the edge off a little bit. Maybe? Eh, I don't know. Also at RondoAward.com are the directions for how to vote in this year's awards. Now, I'm just going to briefly say... You do not have to vote for every single category. If you just want to cherry pick, if you just want to pick and choose a couple of categories, that's fine. All you got to do is let the people at the Rondo Award side of things know who you want to vote for and for what category. Vote for all the categories. Vote for one. Maybe only suggest a Monster Kid Hall of Fame or Monster Kid of the Year. That's fine. All you got to do is email taraco at aol.com. And that is spelled T as in Tom, A-R-A-C as in cat, O, at AOL.com. That's Taraco at AOL.com. Of course, that's over at RondoAward.com as well. So you'll find that information there as well. Now, as far as, well, I'm going to do what everybody else does when they turn up on the ballot. Please consider voting for Monster Kid Radio for Multimedia Site. I'd really appreciate your support. It means a lot. Being on the ballot... That is amazing. Monster Kid Radio has been on the ballot consistently. Ever since we launched, we've been on the ballot. The Rondo Awards have continuously honored Monster Kid Radio by giving us this honor and including us amongst so many other amazing podcasts and websites. It's so cool. It means so much. I did win the 2014 Rondo Award for a multimedia site. I'm looking at my Rondo Award right now. He's lonely. He would really like a tag team partner. And the only way I can get a tag team partner for him is if I win another award. And well, you know how I can win another award, right? Yeah, you gotta vote. And really, after the year that I've had, 
with everything that I'm still dealing with, I, I, yeah, um, it would be amazing to have another one. I'm not trying to guilt you into it, though, really. I want you to vote for what your favorites are. I want you to vote for who you think was the best when it comes to multimedia, when it comes to writing, when it comes to all of this. And here's what's really cool. If there's something missing from the ballot, if there was a movie, a multimedia site, an article, a Blu-ray commentary, or even a book that's missing from the ballot, in your opinion, like Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors by this week's guest, Stephen D. Sullivan, you can do a write-in. You can write in who you think deserves the award. The Monster Kid Hall of Fame and the Monster Kid of the Year, Artist of the Year, those things work a little bit differently. And like I said, I'm going to go over that again next week in a more in-depth segment about the Rondos. You can read all about it, though, again, at rondoaward.com. If you support Monster Kid Radio, if you support any of the other podcasts or websites listed on there, thank you. Let's just make the Rondo Awards bigger and bigger every year, and we can only do that if you vote with your participation, with you spreading the word about the Rondos. All right, let's go ahead and get into the rest of the show. We're going to go ahead and kick things off with the Beta Capsule Review from Mark, get into Kenny, get into the conversation about Supernatural, and, well, whew, that's enough for this week, right? I, yeah, let's, let's go. This is the night when fear and horror walk hand in hand. This is Black Sabbath. Starring the incomparable Boris Karloff, the personable Mark Damon, and lush and lovely women. Even though one is from the netherworld, a vampire, a burdelac. Black Sabbath, as ancient as superstition, as modern as the telephone. How nice you look with that towel around you. You always did have a beautiful body. Beautiful. A body to drive someone crazy. Who are you? Who? Black Sabbath. The bare truth about the unbelievable such as the brilliant beauty of a priceless jewel that holds within the body of a buzzing fly a vengeful woman's murderous spirit. <coughs> Only on the seventh night of the seventh full moon can the living see the lifeless undead. I am hungry. Is he man? <laughs> Vampire. An adventure into black magic that goes beyond the boundaries of the supernatural. And a man's devoted love is welcomed by a woman's deadly lust for his blood. I am Dr. Lee Cushing. Welcome to my Chamber of Horrors. Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is a serialized monster rally novel in the tradition of the classic Universal and Hammer horror films. It's written by Stephen D. Sullivan, the award-winning author of White Zombie, Daikaiju Attack, Manos, The Hands of Fate, and the original chill role-playing game. My goal is to recreate the thrills of the Monster vs. Monster films that we all love. We'll have vampires, werewolves, mummies, psychic twins, and scheming madmen. And that's just in the first storyline. Now you can get Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors and other monster stories sent directly to your email for as little as a dollar a month. For just two dollars, you'll get all the chapters in advance, plus bonus stories and other perks. 
Sign up now at CushingHorrors.com or visit SDSullivan.com for a Patreon link. I do hope you've enjoyed your visit. Please come again. And remember, the chamber is always waiting for its next victim. Horrors of Spider Island. Eight beautiful girls and one lone man struggling for survival. With death, sudden, violent, and horrible lurking in the shadows. Horrors of Spider Island. Out of the night came a fate worse than death. A man's mind twisted, his brain poisoned with an uncontrollable lust to kill. Horrors of Spider Island. A tale of terror that will leave you limp. So hideous and shocking, you won't believe your eyes. His hunger for victims was never satisfied. to be frightened out of your wits by the horrors of Spider Island. Live from the land of light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. On their way home from a pilot's conference in Hong Kong, Ipe and June, who are passengers on a supersonic jet airliner, find themselves at the center of the disappearance of Flight 206. This, the 27th episode of Ultra Q, premiered July 3, 1966. Yuriko and Dr. Ichinotani, who are waiting at Tokyo's Haneda International Airport, sense trouble with the flight. They consult with the Chief of Air Traffic Control, a former student of the good doctor, who confirms that the plane has dropped off of radar, though its engines can be heard at the airport. Meanwhile, Ipe and June regain consciousness to discover that Flight 206 seems to have slipped into a different dimension, as a criminal, who is also on board, tries to leverage the situation to his advantage. The Disappearance of Flight 206 features an all-star supporting cast, beginning with Hiroshi Koizumi as the air traffic controller. At this point in his storied career, Koizumi had starred in at least seven major kaiju films, beginning with 1955's Godzilla Raids Again. He may be best known for his role as Dr. Chujo in 1961's Mothra, to which he returned 42 years later for 2003's Godzilla Tokyo SOS. The pilot of the ill-fated Flight 206 was played by Hisaya Ito, a true veteran of Toho fantasy films, starting with The Mysterians in 1957, and in 1964 essaying a memorable performance as the assassin Malmes in Ghidra, the Three-Headed Monster. The ill-tempered criminal on Flight 206 was Nadeo Kirino, also an experienced actor in the Toho system, who will reappear in Ultraman as the mysterious Dr. Jiro Goto. There is a monster in episode 27, a giant walrus named Totala, about which almost nothing can be said from a story standpoint. Historically, it is the same walrus costume that appeared in 1962's Gorath. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. The Mysterium! The Mysterium! The Mysterium! You are now inside a flying saucer. Our destination, the planet Earth. We are the Mysterium. Our race is old, dying, our planet dead. Only you of Earth, you and your women, can give us life. And what we want, we take. 
swooping down from outer space. Blowing up from the lower depths. The Mysterians. Creatures who knew the uttermost secrets of the atom before our planet was born. Love-hungry spacemen come to seize our women that their dying race may live. It started in the east. Soon it swept the west. The all-out horror of interplanetary war. See giant robots no earthly weapon can destroy rip a path of destruction across the land. See the forces of nature harnessed to the invader's will wipe entire cities from the face of the world. See the earth itself crumble beneath your feet. The Mysterians. Threatening our civilization with weapons beyond the belief of modern science. Flying ray guns that blast everything before them. An impregnable fortress that hides in the earth. Gamma rays that melt the heaviest armament. As men and machines disintegrate before your eyes. The Mysterious. What power can stop their ruthless advance? See the blazing holocaust of an earth gone mad. See on the giant screen in flaming color. The Mysterious. A remote Pacific island where an expedition of world-famous scientists investigate incredible rumors of its fantastic mysteries and discover barren volcanic mountains surrounding strange green valleys. Mammoth caves that breed giant mutations. Vampire plants that devour humans. But most astounding of all, the tiniest women in all creation. Sacred beauties of a lost tribe which worships a monstrous creature. What is the secret of Mothra? What is the bizarre spell that awakens Mothra? As these doll sized girls call to the super god from captivity. Mothra, whose revenge is more devastating than any man-made weapon. Mothra, who defies warplanes. Wrecks ocean liners. Smashes dams and bridges. Mothra, creating hurricanes. Mothra, enveloped in a shell that no human force can penetrate. indestructible, all-powerful, indescribable. What kind of creature is this god monster, Mothra? Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. Today we are going to look at films covered in FM 38 from April of 1966. We start out with the second part of the 20 Million Miles to Earth film book. Let's look at how the thrilling battle between Emir and an elephant was described. Battle to the death. For a moment, the thing from Venus stood framed within the ragged opening. The elephant on the path startled at the appearance of the thing, lifted its trunk nervously and bleated in fright. The pachyderm raised its massive forefeet in the air. The pole fell out of the keeper's hand. He reached down to retrieve it, just as the creature attacked. Trumpeting first in fear and then in responsive fury, the mammoth reared to meet the charge of the alien beast. The crowd broke and scattered, and then returned in a wide, odd circle to watch the struggle between the gargantuan animals. The emir, undismayed by the first counterattack of the elephant, sprung again with renewed savagery. It bulldozed its way toward the gray animal, ignoring its sharp tusks. A news photographer hurried closer with his camera poised. With a roar, the creature tore at the throat of the elephant with its taloned hands, and the violence of its attack sent the gray mammoth off its feet. Look out, the crowd shrieked, but it was too late to warn the two men close to the scene of the battle. The elephant's massive body thudded heavily to the ground, pinning cameraman and zookeeper beneath tons of flesh and bone. The elephant was back on his feet now, edging away from the snarling creature that had come from space to do its battle. The emir moved after it, and the combatants headed into the streets, their animal cries resounding through the quiet avenues. 
Now there were horrible gashes torn in the side of the elephant, blood pouring freely from the wounds inflicted by the creature's raking teeth and talons. Still the mammoth fought on. Then, with a monstrous shriek, the creature closed in for the kill. It drove straight for the elephant's throat, its fangs sinking deeply into the leathery flesh. In a last brave effort, the elephant tried to shake the jaws of the creature loose from its bleeding throat. But the more it struggled, the more deeply the fangs penetrated. Fatally wounded, it trumpeted a last note of defiance, shuddered, and laid still. After that, we have a look at White Zombie. Before and after the full synopsis, we had this interesting information. Black Sorcery in Haiti, Island of Unnatural Hatreds and Voodoo Practices. I saw this picture in 1932 when I was 16 years old. Even as film monster fans do today, I cut clippings about it out of the papers, saved them, and now I can share them with you. Everywhere in the USA and abroad today are new fans of fantastic films, and I know that you too are saving information for the future. In the year 2000, some among you will have film monster scrapbooks to show your grandchildren and to help editors of the 21st century report on the 20th century's treasure trove of terror tales of the screen. An eerie, spooky motion picture reads the clipping, which for sheer mystery outdoes all its predecessors, is White Zombie. This picture may safely be said to be in a class by itself. Its story deals with occult practices in remote sections of Haiti where zombies, or dead bodies, are dug from their graves and, by a process of sorcery, reanimated and put to work in the fields and mills as slaves. The story is staggering. Whether or not you believe what you see in this picture, you will be enthralled by its presentation, particularly when you learn that there is a wealth of evidence to bear out its authenticity. The entire picture is done with such artistry and with such conviction and sincerity that one cannot but believe its substance. Certainly, White Zombie exerts the greatest appeal upon the emotions of any recent motion picture. And this appeal is infinitely heightened by the strain the story puts upon credulity. But when one recalls that several eminent American writers have recently borne out the existence of these undead creatures, in particular William Seabrook with his book The Magic Island, one is staggered by this fantastic exposition. Bela Lugosi, creator of Dracula, carries the main burden of White Zombie, and no more sinister character portrayal can be imagined. Lugosi is far and away the leading exponent of this type of role, and he surpasses himself here. The cover story is next, a look at Curse of the Demon. FM 38's cover featured the titular beast painted by Vic Precio. Here is how this film book was presented. Supernatural horrors hurled against the man and woman who dare to doubt. Terrifying adventure as a demon from the dark ages is pitted against a man of science in a war of two worlds, the real and the unreal. Medieval black magic versus the 20th century's own brand of anti-witchcraft weaponry. From hell it came, a monster materializing on the screen before your fear-fraught eyes. You will come to scoff and stay to shudder. As a modern scientist and a beautiful girl fight, a thing that burns in the night. Skeptical? Don't make up your mind till you see this masterpiece of the macabre. Most terrifying story the screen has ever told. These were some of the bold declarations made about Curse of the Demon when it burst upon the screen in 1958 like a thunderball. If it wasn't absolutely the most terrifying story ever seen on the screen, it was indeed a masterpiece of the macabre. As a matter of editorial policy, this magazine rarely passes judgment on a picture, only presenting the facts. But in this case, the facts added up to such a worthwhile and memorable monster movie that the editor breaks with tradition. It was a sleeper where no one slept, deserving of the highest praise. It was in its year that The Uninvited, Dead of Night, The Haunting, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Burn Witch Burn were in their years. Jacques Tournay directed the unforgettable, excellent Cat People. Curse of the Demon, known in England as Night of the Demon, is another triumph, and well worth seeing any time revived in a movie or on TV. As fate would have it, I found myself talking on the phone with Mr. Tournier a few days before writing this review. 
He told me he hopes to film Kaleidoscope by Ray Bradbury and War of the Witches, his own idea. He told me that he did not care for the introduction of the fire demon into the plot of Curse of the Demon, that he felt it weakened the effect of the picture. But I emphatically disagree. After that is a short article on Invasion of the Saucermen. Here is the brief introduction to the synopsis. This was one of American International's earliest monster movies. Running 70 minutes, it was based on the short story The Cosmic Frame by Fowl W. Fairman. It was first shown in 1957. Comic relief was Lynn Osborner, one of the stars of the original TV Space Patrol, who died around the time of the release of the picture. Also in this issue is a look at the Doctor Who TV show and an Italian made-for-television movie, Hercules and the Princess of Troy. It featured three pictures of a cool giant sea bug that is quite impressive for its time. Let's hear the intro. Siegfried's unforgettable dragon was built two generations ago by the Germans. Now the Italians have come up with a sea creature of similar huge proportions and complexity to menace Tarzan. Uh, correction, X tarzan Gordon Scott, now known as Hercules. Bug-eyed, multi-limbed, long technical Max, as he was affectionately dubbed by cast and crew during filming, is a steel and plastic monster measuring 25 feet from snout to tail. Snaking around on his insides are 10 miles of wire. It takes an electronic system as intricate as an IBM computer to power the six large engines that make Max look alive. He's operated by two electronics experts who manipulate his movements from afar via remote control transistor radios. You can have a duplicate of Max yourself for only $25,000. Ask Dad for one for your next birthday, in case you don't want to live that long. Look up Hercules and the Princess of Troy on the internet to see this well-done animatronic monster in action. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next week. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. Hello, police tank orders? This is Carter, Johnny Carter. Oh, sure, they're from another planet. What a dilemma for young lovers Steve Terrell and Gloria Castile. You thought I was kidding. Nobody will believe the invasion of the saucer men. All this makes it seem natural for a beer-drinking bull to appoint himself chaperone of Lover's Lane. Hey, for Pete's sake! And a farmer with the longest shotgun you've ever seen plays the villain. What's so funny? Well, I expected to be frightened on my wedding night, but nothing like this. It's our busy night, too. We've been flooded with calls from people who say they've seen flying saucers and little green monsters. wonder how that rumor ever got started. (laughs) It's too fantastic to believe. Just think of it. Only this special unit and the President of the United States will know what happened here tonight. It has been written since the beginning of time that evil, supernatural creatures exist in a world of darkness. And it is also said, man can call forth these powers of darkness, the demons of hell. is the night of the demon. And tonight is the night that Dana Andrews, as a daring scientist, defies the mysterious murderous devil cult in a desperate battle against the demons of hell. Ah, why did you drop the poker? Red hot. Didn't you know? Oh, my boy, you're as pale as death. There was something in here. He has been chosen. I've been chosen for what? What do you mean? Today I found all the pages of my desk calendar torn out after October the 22nd. I know why. He died on the 22nd. John, what's the matter? The same thing happened to my desk calendar after the 28th. The frightened girl. The master of witchcraft. 
You will die, as I said, at 10 o'clock on the 28th of this month. Your time allowed is just three days from now. Skeptical? Don't make up your mind till you see this masterpiece of macabre magic. Because, after all, evil supernatural creatures really do exist. Okay, Monster Kid Radio listeners, the other day I was online and I saw my friend Steve Sullivan, who happens to be on the other end of the microphone right now, mentioned that he just watched the movie Supernatural from 1933. And I thought, that's a great movie. I love that film. I want to talk to Steve about it. So I reached out to him. We set it up. I had never seen the film. I had confused it with something else completely. You too. (laughs) Well, that was my thing. It was like, I was very sure I had seen this film. Until I read about it, and I'm like, have I ever seen this at all? <laughs> and it turned out I hadn't seen it at all either. <laughs> I, I put it on last night before going to bed, and I'm watching it, and I'm like, wait, wait, where's Faye Ray? I was mixing it up with Black Moon. There you go. Which I've seen too, yeah, and I can totally see that. Yeah, so um, this was a first-time watch for me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, it's funny, you know, if you're a long-time Monster Kid, as, as I am and as you are too at this point, some of the stuff that you don't watch a lot, like the non-universal or non-Hammer classics, this starts to kind of blur in your mind. And you start to kind of replace titles that you think you know, like Black Moon and Supernatural. Those are, they're around the same time period. They've got the, you know, a similar kind of feeling to them. And suddenly you think you've seen something that you haven't. That's not the one I was confusing Supernatural with. The one I was confusing it with was the one with Claude Rains, where he's a psychic medium, which I cannot remember the name of right off the top of my head. But I thought this was a different film, too. And eventually figured out it wasn't, got it on Blu-ray, and then just this past week I had some time. I should really watch this movie because it's got Carol Lombard in it. and It's directed by Victor Halpern, and that's one of the reasons I thought of it was because I think Victor Halpern, who also directed White Zombie, had come up on the uh, the Monster Kid movie club somehow. Right, uh, yeah. Oh, because he directed Torture Ship. Yeah. And that had gotten me, reminded me that I had this thing I hadn't watched. And I watched it, and I was like, holy cow. <laughs> so you had a similar experience, it sounds like. Yeah, so I'm watching, I'm like, but I thought, and then I realized, like, oh my God, this is the wrong. So I mixed it up with Black Moon. You mixed it up with another Fay Ray movie, The Clairvoyant. That's it, with yes. With Claude Rains and Fay Ray. How we mix up Carol Lombard and Fay Ray, I have no idea. Because, I mean, they're both great, but... yeah. What? You know, and Carol Lombard is not somebody that you see in a lot of genre pictures, really. I mean, she's right. very famous as a comedian, been married to, to Clark Gable, you know, to, died tragically in a, a plane crash after doing a, a wartime Bond tour thing back in, I think, Indiana or someplace like that. So it's the legendary Carol Lombard. And this was maybe the only genre thing that she was in. You know, I, I didn't go over her whole list of stuff, and she was in quite a lot of stuff for someone that died so young. She did a lot. She was working as early as the 20s uh, doing a lot of work and, and really kind of came into her own, I feel like, late 30s, early 40s, and then unfortunately what happened. But, I mean, she she is one of these classic Hollywood actresses. When you think about, you know, classic Hollywood, she's a name that can come up real easily. Yep. Gable and Lombard were, uh, you know, one of the classic Hollywood couples. And the fact that she died so young, she died, I think she was 33, and she died at literally at the height of her powers. I happened to see, a, not the whole thing, but a good chunk of To Be or Not To Be with Jack Benny, which she is the main female character in. Within the last month, it happened. It was on TCM, and I happened to catch a bunch of them, and I'm like, gosh, this is a great little movie. And, yeah. she's, and she is so brilliant. She is so wonderful in that and in things like My Man Godfrey and Nothing Sacred. The Thousand, 
that's the one I was going to bring up was my man Godfrey because I went on, I got on a William Powell kick a while back because I love the Thin Man movies. Yep. And as much as I love William Powell and Myrna Loy together in those films, I thought Powell and Lombard were great together in my man Godfrey. Well, they were, and they and yeah. they were married. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, Carol Lombard, I think she was married twice to William Powell and Clark Gable. It's like, holy cow, that's... Uh... I mean, not that I want to replace Myrna Loy or anything out of the Thin Man films, but really, I mean, wow. Yeah, no. <laughs> anyway, she was brilliant and, and uh, gone too soon. So, yeah. what you going to say about that, other than she's in this... First time watch for me. <laughs> first time watch for me, too. She's in this really cool movie that apparently maybe all of you have been confusing with <laughs> the clairvoyant or Black Moon or something else, too. <laughs> One might say that's uh, supernatural. <laughs> One might say Oh, that. man. Ah, what, what a cool little movie. It's only about an hour. It's like barely over an hour long. Yep. It, it's really kind of short, sweet to the point gets in, gets out, does its thing. It really could have played like, I, I wouldn't say as far as like a Twilight Zone thing, but it could have played like a uh, something from like a TV horror anthology show. Yeah. The way it's kind of set up like a Tales from the Crypt style almost. Yeah, in a, in a way. I mean, it's it's very, honestly, for 1933, it was not what I expected. I mean, we are in, in the middle of the, even though there's horror stuff going on, a lot of stuff that would be set up like this film would turn out to be a Scooby-Doo ending. Which is something that I really love about this, is that unless you're over at Universal, you're right. It's usually some sort of scooby doo kind of thing, right? Right. Which I don't have a problem with. She's not se. really turning into a werewolf. Somebody's gaslighting her and making right. her believe she's turned into a werewolf. And I guess Universal was guilty of that, too, a little bit every once in a while. But, you know, for the most part, you didn't see that. These movies were all like, well, you know, we're not we're not monster movies. We're telling a drama where somebody pretends to be a ghost. No, nah, this one just embraces it. Right, yeah. You know, it's and it's really cool. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about the, the plot a little bit, too. Do you want to... Should we do the Classic Five first? I was going to say, well, before we get too far into it, well, even before the Classic Five, I want to hear what's going on with you, Steve. What is going on with me, Steve? Steve is has finished <laughs> a... Steve now refers to himself in the third yes. person, but okay. <laughs> Steve has <is> finished. <laughs> I have uh, finished a draft of the outline for my Paul Nashy project, so I'm about to start writing that. That's kind of an open secret with everyone, and I'll... I can talk about it more if you want, but I'm about to start that. But I'm also doing Atomic Tales with Christopher Mim, wherein I write these cool science fiction horror stories, very short, and he turns them into short kind of radio play productions. And I think we've even heard at least one, maybe more, on Monster Kid Radio by the time you hear us. So that's pretty exciting. I'm having a good time doing that. And mostly just you know, trying to keep all the plates in the air, as it were, and looking forward to upcoming cool things on TV or HBO Max and that kind of stuff. So so working on werewolves, working on giant bugs is what I'm kind of mostly up to currently, although I will be revising uh, the Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors role-playing game because the printer just changed the formats that they offer them in, and the format we used, which had staples, is now gone. <laughs> You can still get the uh, the PDF version of that, but you can't get the print version. And of course, uh, Frost Hour Harrow is ongoing in uh, my site sdsullivan.com, and and Doctor Cushing is is ongoing too. But I haven't put out anything new for that since the Congo creature story at the end of the year. Although now that now you've got me talking on this, I'll never stop. There's a, a short story called Blood of Dracula that is set in the Dr. Cushing universe and is a prequel to the second Dr. Cushing book that is coming out this month, which is March, as we're talking about that, and an anthology, a benefit anthology called Turning the Tide, and that's T-I-E-D, like tied up, or not like tide that comes in from the ocean, uh, from the Tie-In Writer Association, uh, the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers, to benefit literacy. So... There we go. We've got Dr. Cushing, we've got Frost Arrow running on the site, we've got giant bugs in Atomic Tales, and we've got werewolves coming up soon. All right. It's probably more than I'm forgetting. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I paused there because usually there's more going on. So there's, There probably is, and it's, you know. But but you know what? We'll, we'll call it. <laughs> I was going to say, I, you know, the, 
pandemic brain, it's like, in theory, we all have less to do, but somehow we're much less efficient at doing what we normally do because of the pandemic. So, you know, dude, you're lucky if I'm wearing pants. Come on. <laughs> Are you in pants? Uh, happily, I can't see one way or the other. <laughs> Yeah, so moving on. Moving uh, <laughs> on. Anyway, very busy. All of us very busy. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, stsullivan.com, of course, links on the website, the whole bit. Y'all know how it works. Yep. AtomicTales.com, CushingHorrors.com. I have. Oh, did, did he buy AtomicTales.com? I have AtomicTales.com. Oh, you bought it. Yep, okay. I have it. It's mine. Pandemic brain. Am I worried? Where are my pants? Anyway, <laughs> Classic Five. Classic Five. <laughs> the Classic Five from Derek. M. Cook! <laughs> we got it live this time. Awesome. Okay. All right. So the classic five for people who may just now be joining us or happen to only listen to an episode in which I forget to do it. The classic five is a game that we play on every episode of Monster Kid Radio and in the Monster Kid Movie Club, where I have a deck of cards here, an actual deck of cards that you can pick up for your very own if you wanted to buy it and play along at home with your friends or whatever. Go over to tinyurl.com slash classic five, and that's five spelled out. Anyway, each one of these cards has a this or that, which movie do you prefer style question. There are no wrong answers. It's just a way to get Monster Kids talking, breaking the ice, spending some time, or, or having a segment on a podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> Steve, are you ready to play a round of the Classic Five? I'm ready to give it a shot. All right, here we go. I'm going to try to pull some questions that may not have turned up lately. I really need to get that second deck going. Stay tuned, listeners. All right, here we go. Question number one. Which movie do you prefer, Planet of the Vampires or Planet of the Apes? Planet of the Apes. Discover Planet of the Apes. A civilization where humans run wild in the jungles, and the superior beings are apes. Tribunal has placed you in my custody for final disposition. Do you realize what that means? No. Emasculation to begin with. Then experimental surgery on the speech centers, on the brain. Then a kind of living death. I love them both, but the Planet of the Apes is is a classic. It's got a great performance by Charlton Heston. It's got the amazing makeup. And it's got the, the great Rod Serling ending to it, too. It's it's just hard to beat. Planet of the Vampires is very cool and has a lot of kind of alien like stuff. I think I've never seen it except dubbed. So maybe it'd be interesting to see it dubbed. And it's obviously it's got had a lot of influences on space horror movies. Sure, a lot of alien came from that. You can see. But Planet of the Apes is a you know it's spun off a whole franchise of largely very very good films. So. Yeah, I love Planet of the Apes. Get to be fair, Planet of the Vampires does have a twist ending as well. I don't want to say what it, it is does. in case you haven't seen it, but yeah. It does, and it's a pretty good one. Um, and it's, it's got a lot of cool stuff, and I, I like it. And I actually, I recently bought it on HD because the uh, the Blu-ray of it, I think, doesn't have any extras compared to the, the DVD. That's one of my, one of the reasons that I will buy something digitally rather than physically is if you've upgraded the picture and not added anything new. So, you know, my DVD is the same as the Blu-ray, except the Blu-ray has a, a better picture. Well, why spend twenty dollars on a Blu-ray if you can get the get the actual H D copy for five bucks, right? Weird to hear go. weird to hear me say that, right? Because I'm such a physical media guy, but that's that's where I'm at now on the on collecting movies. I just saw somebody post on Facebook at the last center this morning that one of these digital streaming sites is shutting down. And, and it's a bigger one where you wasn't just showing movies. You actually could, quote unquote, buy your movie there and it would always be part of your library there. But with this site shutting down, people are going to lose all their movies. Jeez. And I yeah, I hope it's I not voodoo. <laughs> No, it wasn't Voodoo. It wasn't one that I u have ever used. So it wasn't even like, and I don't even use Movie Spree. I know you use Movie Spree, but I do. Uh, you know, it wasn't Voodoo. It wasn't one of these bigger ones. But yeah, I remember I see I saw it, and some people were lamenting that their entire library is going to go. And 
You know, I mean, you read the fine print on these digital sites like this, and you don't ever really own the movie. You're just kind of licensing it f- through them to, yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, it the whole be, thing, man. It can be slippery, but I always have my my uh, Planet of the Vampires on DVD if I have to fall back to that. Okay, there you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, question number two. Which movie do you prefer, The Leech Woman or The Wasp Woman? I like, again, as with a lot of these questions, I really like them both. And I, I love the universal production values on the Leech Woman, and I love that it's it's a really twisted story. It's a story about this woman who decides that killing men to maintain her youth is not such a terrible thing, and in some ways, it's the same story as the Wasp Woman. I'm going to go with the Wasp Woman though, because monster. <laughs> A woman of fantastic desires, sponsoring a scientist with fantastic theories and demanding fantastic results. How old do I look? Tell me! How old? 23. The enzymes, the enzymes, they're, they're going crazy. Miss Darling will kill her and tear her body to shreds. I always like monsters, and the wasp woman is kind of a cool-looking monster. And I like the fact that it's, it's kind of an anti-sexist movie in a lot of ways, even though it is from the, the time period where... Th- even if you have an anti-sexist message, there's going to be some sexism that creeps in. It's just the way it is. But uh, monster, there's a monster in the Wasp Woman. It's a great double feature. Yeah, if you get a chance to watch them together. They're a great double feature. Yeah, cool. If- uh, which is how I saw them most recently, outside of when I showed Wasp Woman on the stream. So I think TCM showed them back to back, which I thought was interesting. Oh, that's awesome. That's that's one yeah. of the things I really like about curated programming. At, at places like TCM is, is an, a really obvious example of curated programming is that you get unexpected juxtapositions that some clever wag has come up with. Like tonight on Turner Classic Movies, as we record this, I looked at them and I'm like, what are they doing tonight? Oh, they're doing all movies that have the title Sweet in the, in the title of the movie. <laughs> So there's a very wow. kind of wide, weird range of things that they're playing. And I, and I love that. I love seeing that, whether it's TCM or the film detective or wherever, where you kind of get interesting juxtapositions and interesting groupings that maybe you wouldn't think of just grabbing stuff off of your shelf. And I thought I was starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel, coming up with themes to do for the stream. <laughs> Look at the, uh, if you get a chance, look at, at TCM's guide for tonight. I don't even remember what they are, but the, there's a whole lot of interesting movies with the word sweet in the title. Sweet Smell of Success is the only one that's popping into my, my, my mind. Sweet Charity might be another one. It's just a very weird kind of grouping, but a lot of them are good movies. So there you go. Interesting. All right. All right. Yeah, I was trying to pull up the, the TCM schedule because now I'm real curious. <laughs> Sweet smell. So, okay, sweet smell of success. Murder my sweet. Right. Uh, Just those see. two alone. It's like what? <laughs> Bittersweet. How sweet it is, and sweet Jesus preacher man. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever think of doing that with your own library? I've never even heard of sweet Jesus preacher man. <laughs> <laughs> Hitman hides out as a preacher in a ghetto. Ch- I'm in. That sounds great. I was going to say that's a, that's a black exploitation picture. Maybe <laughs> that sounds awesome. I need to see this. Actually, I need to make sure I record that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's coming up on my, at 4 a.m. on my schedule here, so I can set the DVR. There you go. I got time. I got time. That's awesome. All right. Yep. Sweet Jesus preacher man sounds great. Yeah, and the the wasp woman leech woman thing. That's that's a great parent. Right on. All right. Day the Earth Stood Still or Earth versus the Flying Saucers? Oh, my God. Now you're making it hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk my way through this. They're both classics. Among the classics of classics, I think if you just looked at the pure quality of the film, The Day the Earth Stood is 
one of the there if I gave both films five stars and I might if I had to pick just based on film quality Day of the Earth Stood Still is one of the great science fiction films of all time period it's probably in the top five <laughs> right Earth vs. Sure. Flying Saucers not that quite quite that good on a filmic level so if you're saying which is a better film I'd pick Day of the Earth Stood Still which I, and I love both these films I should point that out but if you're going to say hey we can watch one of these two which one are you going to watch I'm going to pick Earth vs. the Flying Saucers almost all the time because <laughs> it's a popcorn movie it's a Harryhausen movie we all know that every year on Harryhausen's birthday I watch Harryhausen films all day and I've been doing that for, right. I don't know a decade or something like that in a long time and Harryhausen's got enough movies that you can do that and still watch them during the year and enjoy them. So, I guess, I guess I'm going with Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Flying Saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris, Moscow are key targets. The whole world is under attack. Can it survive? Never before has the screen reached such heights of excitement, breathtaking spectacle, hair-raising terror. See the saucer men's high-frequency disintegrator. See flying saucers travel thousands of miles in seconds. See great cities leveled by flying saucer monsters. Russ, look. The same kind of thing that's watched us since the beginning of the project. People of Earth, attention. People of Earth, attention. This is a voice speaking to you from thousands of miles beyond your planet. They're coming down to take over. They made that clear to us in the saucer. But I love the other one to pieces, too. Um, And if I had to pick based on score, on just the music... Like the both of the the scores to both of them too, but one of them is by <laughs> one of them the day the Earth stood still is by Bernard Herrmann, and Bernard Herrmann is the composer who accompanies my writing almost more certainly more than any other composer I think. When I write, like a lot of people, I don't write with things that have lyrics on in the background. Oh, no, I, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I, I have to have... It's got to be instrumentation, instrumental stuff. And so usually I pick movie scores that are related to what I'm working on in some way. And my selection of Bernard Herman scores, uh, if I'm staring at it up here, is if everyone else except John Williams has uh, an inch or two inches of shelf space my bernard herman collection is probably 10 inches <laughs> across or something like that i have a lot of bernard herman scores and i love them and his day the earth stood still score is it's amazing and you can also hear it in the twilight zone and other places like that because they they licensed it for for clips at some point so it's an amazing score so is that a complex enough answer for question number three? No, it's funny. You know, here's the thing. There are movies that I know that are excellent films. Day of the Earth Stood Still. But it's not one that I'm like, boy, I'm itching to watch this movie again. You know, I mean, it's one of those movies that I can watch, I can think about, I can really dwell on, and it means a lot. Right. But if I'm just looking to fill some time, that's not the movie I put on. Right. It's the Flying Saucers. Yeah. It's a movie that requires a little bit more brain power to... And there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not no. saying that I don't like those kinds of movies. No, Just, absolutely not. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, you know, that and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, they're going to require you to think a little bit. They're, they're not going to throw the Flying Saucers disintegrating stuff across your screen all the time. You know, and sometimes, sometimes you want the monsters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rather than the you know, the brilliant acting and suspense and that kind of stuff. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't want Hitchcock. <laughs> sometimes you want Corman. <laughs> and I love them both, obviously. All right, let's see. That was the third question. Yep. All right. Card number, question number four. Where where my list go? Favorite Barbara Steele film? Oh, man, that's, that's hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's so easy to say Black Sunday. Because I'm 
not only have I seen that very recently because she's brilliant in that, and then that has uh, a lot of very cool stuff. I also just watched Piranha, the original Piranha recently, which she oh no, <laughs> which, which I love, which she has. She is the kind of evil scientist. Yeah. In Piranha, have, have you seen Joe Dante's Piranha? It's awesome. It's been a long time. It's yeah. a really good. It's a really good Roger Corman exploitation horror film. I, I love it a lot. It's, it's easily the best of the Jaws inspired killer animal films. So I just watched her in that, and she's terrific in that. It's been too long since I've watched it, but I, you know, I think I'm gonna say just for perversity's sake, Long Hair of Death. The Long Hair of Death. Our story takes place at the end of the 15th century, a time when the powers of darkness were at their strongest, and man lived in fear of the unknown. A time when witch burning was a common occurrence, a public spectacle. The Long Hair of Death. Long Hair of Death is really, really cool. I'll go with Long Hair of Death just to, to make people get up and, and check it out. And maybe to, okay. to make myself rewatch it too. I I pretty much love everything Barbara Steele is in. I mean, she even makes the ghost fun, and she's not in the ghost very, very much. But I, I love her, and she is one of those people that I need to check and see if I've actually gotten all of her horror films on DVD or Blu-ray. I was getting close. I, I keep lists occasionally. I have a list of Lugosi and Karloff and Barbara Steele and Paul Nashi to try to get everything that I can, aside from maybe TV appearances. Sounds good. All right, final question. Let's do The Haunted Palace or Die, Monster, Die? Mm, good, good question. Two Lovecraft-inspired films, though one of them claims to be a Poe-inspired film. <laughs> well, yeah. Both out of the Corman company, one directed by Corman directly. Right. Daniel Haller did the design on both. And, a, and I love them both. And the, the only thing I don't like about Die, Monster, Die is that the final creature is a, a little bit of a letdown for me. But the reason that I'm going to go with The Haunted Palace is because it's one of Vincent Price's great performances. He's just fabulous in it. And we've got Lon Chaney Jr. too. And it's got a great score by Ronald Stein. So overall, I think this kind of shows what a good director Corman is too. It's just a better film on pretty much every level and it's super creepy and uh, perhaps the best early Lovecraft adaptation there is out there. You are invited to an open house where horror will be your host. The Haunted Palace. You, who find a kind of macabre joyousness in the horrifying, will enjoy yourselves as in ecstasy in The Haunted Palace, starring Vincent Price, a being who lived and died and lives again. Lovecraft is really hard to adapt in some ways, and uh, Hollywood struggled with it a lot until fairly recently. So, And even now, you know, it's like, okay... <laughs> What are we getting in yeah. a Lovecraft film? Are we really getting a Lovecraft film, or are we getting uh, someone's weird and weird sexual interpretation of a Lovecraft film? So, uh, Haunted Palace. I'm going with Haunted Palace. <laughs> was that a, was that a slight uh, Stuart Gordon dig there? Is that what that was? Oh, actually, I love the Stuart <laughs> Gordon films. I do too. I, I do too. No disrespect. No, yeah. and no disrespect to the, the late great Stuart Gordon. I would actually say that. Until Stuart Gordon did Lovecraft films, I didn't, I didn't think there were like really good ones, except except Haunted Palace, which of course, as a youngster, I didn't realize was a Lovecraft film. Because, sure, sure. Because they've disguised it as a Poe film. Um, so no, I love the Stuart Gordon ones. It's just sometimes other other people do things that that somehow don't seem as appropriate. 
I don't know. I, you know, I mean, Lovecraft is not a very sexual writer. <laughs> I think. That's, no, not at uh, all. I mean, I, I like the Stuart Gordon stuff, and I mean, he was a great dude. And a few times I met him, he was great. Um, super supportive of of the Lovecraft Film Festival over the years, that sort of thing. But I think Lovecraft would would have a real problem himself with those films. I, th- I think Har- Lovecraft would have been horrified by the sexuality of them, probably. Well, and, and even just the, the visceralness of it. Right. I mean, Lovecraft was scary, sure, but he wasn't gory. He wasn't bloody. He wasn't splattery at all. Right. And and Gordon was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's fine. You know, you do you, man. He was, um, but weirdly, I, it always worked for me when he did it. You know, yeah. the, whether we're talking about uh, Reanimator or uh, From Beyond or Dagon or uh, Dream, His Dreams of the Witch House thing. He loved Lovecraft. I think that's really mm-hmm. what made oh yeah what made Gordon's stuff work, even though it strays fairly far from from what Lovecraft might have written. Is that his love for Lovecraft comes through really, really clearly, at least to me. Whereas the earlier films, even stuff like The Haunted Palace, we couldn't even name it something for Lovecraft or Die Monster Die. You know, we couldn't we couldn't name it the lovecraft thing we had to change that around we uh, the dunwich horror well that's i guess that's a satan film now not really even though those have very strong lovecraftian elements we didn't like lovecraft enough that we can actually do lovecraft in some sense do you know what i'm saying i don't know if i'd blame the filmmakers for that though i mean i What's the, the, the artist entirely the market that they were looking. yeah i was gonna say it's the studios i mean it's the people they were working for aip didn't think Lovecraft would sell, but they had all those Poe films that did well, so let's call it a Poe film. Right. And and I think if you look at the independent scene, you find a lot more pure Lovecraft adaptations, but I think, and this is something that I've come around on over the years, I, I used to think that the best Lovecraft adaptations are the ones that are period-specific, pure Lovecraft, that sort of thing. But as I've grown, <laughs> and as much as I love the straight-up adaptations, like what the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society did. Those two are awesome. The Call of Cthulhu yeah. and Whisper in the Dark, they're amazing. Um, and Whisper in the Darkness is fantastic. I wish they'd done more. Well, they want to, but they need money, and that's the thing. And they need more money than they think is realistic to get through Kickstarter. So every time I talk to them, and, and every time it comes up on their message boards... They're always talking to people, trying to get something going, trying to get something going. And in the meantime, they're working on other things as well. So they're keeping busy on their own stuff that can bring in some income. But, yeah, I would love to see them do more. And I know they want to do more. They just need the, the budget to do it. And I don't blame them. I mean, they, they've shown that they know what they're doing. That said, I think some of the better Lovecraft ideas can be adapted and, and turned into something else. I love Stuart Gordon's From Beyond. I really right. do. I, I think the... <laughs> there's some sexual stuff in that that I don't think was really necessary per se, <laughs> but you know, it's just Stuart Gordon putting his favorite actress in some compromising clothing, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we'll, and she was we'll, down with it. We she love was you, into Barbara it, so. <laughs> and, and she was into it. I'm not saying anything bad about that. Uh, and I guess William Butler's got something that's going on now. Uh, a Miskatonic series. I, I don't know anything about oh, it. Other really? than I don't know. He was telling everybody on Facebook, they need to watch it. But uh, I don't know much more about it. So if listeners know anything about that, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, and there are other things, you know, that's, uh, as, as you were saying, uh, being a purist on, on this kind of stuff oftentimes will cut you off from some things that are really good. Yeah. Uh, Miskatonic U, The Resonator is the name of the show. And it's p- coming from Full Moon, really? Hmm. Uh, and William Butler um, played, uh, what was the character's name? He was in the remake of Night of the Living Dead. Um, oh, okay. He was uh, the, the boyfriend-girlfriend that get blown up in the car outside. He's the he's the boyfriend. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, and he was talking about it on Facebook. Um, but then we also live in a day and age when, of all things, the movie Cthulhu Mansion is going to get a Blu-ray release. So... <laughs> And I have not seen that, so I... Oh, it's it's awful. <laughs> well, there you go. But, it's you know, it's I mean, terrible. Honestly... I, I kind of want to see it. If it weren't for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, I don't think we'd have any of this stuff except Stuart Gordon, who was going to do it on his own because he loved yeah. it. You know, and it... And God bless Sandy Peterson and the people of the Chaosium that put out the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. It's a, The original was a great game. I 
the new one's probably fine too, but we used to have fun play at TSR oh, creators of Dungeons and Dragons. We used to relax by playing Call of Cthulhu a lot of nights. So, so what does that say about you and your crew? What does that say about you guys? We were all big Lovecraft fans. That's what that I says. know. We'd relax by going insane and playing Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's just weird to me that because of this crazy role-playing game, that suddenly Lovecraft is maybe even more famous than Poe now. It's certainly his stuff is way more places. You don't see a lot of Raven plushies where you got Cthulhu plushies, Cthulhu sculptures, Cthulhu toys, Cthulhu this, Cthulhu that. If if only HP could have... <laughs> Could have lived to have some of that money. I don't know if he'd have approved of any of it, but yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. We, boy, that we have gone way off track, but I don't care. A little, I'm but I'm going to bring us back in just a minute. I, I'm, I'm okay with this. I'm having a good time chatting about this. Lovecraft, even though he did not himself coin the phrase Cthulhu Mythos, basically created a shared universe, right? Yep. And and those things seem to be a little bit easier to merchandise and exploit than, say, a standalone piece. Sure, they teach Edgar Allan Poe in high school. They don't teach Lovecraft in high school. And they certainly won't now that yeah. more people are aware of some of the, the racial stuff, you know, and, right, and, and yeah. rightly well, so. He, and, they, he had, and that's he had fine. despicable views about race that he held for most, if not all, of his life. Right. So they, they teach Poe in school, but there wasn't, a shared universe of Edgar Allan Poe that you can make action figures out of. Right. Okay. <laughs> where, where you can kind of sort of maybe extrapolate from Lovecraft and his, his circle uh, enough material to say, okay, Cthulhu turns up in a few things. Let's make slippers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's even stuff, you know, that obviously inspired the role-playing game, like at the mountains of madness, which is uh -huh. kind of a, a D and D style quest in some sense that, clearly makes for some interaction that maybe you wouldn't have with House of Usher or the Raven or, you know, any pit in the pendulum or, or that kind of stuff. It, there wasn't e ever a sense of people going out to explore unknown things uh, and then going mad, probably, uh, in Poe. So, yeah, the, the, you know, it's you have to let people, creators do what they can do and then you get to decide whether whether you like it or not in terms of Lovecraft and and Poe and, and new versus old and what is new. And the thing that I was going to kind of circle back around to what we were originally talking about today was the other night when I had that free time, I was looking at my piles of things I could watch. And at the top of one of those piles is the Nick Cage Colorado Space, which I have not watched yet. And oh, really? And I actually had, I think I may have even had it in my hand oh, as dude. what I was going to watch that night. But then I thought, okay, is this what I'm going to watch? And I looked at some of the other piles right next to my TV and right there was Carol Lombard's face from Supernatural. And I was the like, cover art for that is amazing, by the way. So yeah, <laughs> I don't blame you. That's a great poster. I was like, okay, I can watch Supernatural or I can watch the cage. And I thought... Hell. I'm sorry, wait, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt you? Did you just say The Cage or Nick Cage? I said Nick Cage. Okay, because The Cage would work too, I'm just saying. Nick Cage, here's a digression about <laughs> Nick Cage. I don't know if you know this. Nick Cage is actually, his real name is Nick Coppola. He actually yeah. he actually took Cage as his last name from Luke Cage, Power Man. Which is, oh yeah, he's a huge geek. He's a huge comic book geek. Right, yeah. He's <laughs> one of us, dude. <laughs> Total digression. Right, right. So I had yeah. these two movies, and I decided to go with the one that had been around my entire life and I hadn't seen yet, and chose Supernatural 1933 with Carol Lombard and Randolph Scott, of all things. Yeah, so uh, to digress just a little bit more, <laughs> I'd be real <laughs> curious to hear your thoughts. Now back to our subject, you want to go for Right, now I'm going to go right back up. <laughs> um, Color Out of Space. Uh, they showed it the Lovecraft, the last live Lovecraft Film Festival. Uh, they showed it here. It was the North American premiere. It was the second time it had been shown anywhere in the world. And the director was there. It was directed by the guy who got booted off the terrible Marlon Brando uh, Island of Dr. Moreau film. Oh. <laughs> um, the guy who did. Why is the guy's name blanking on me right now? Yeah, I, I can't remember it either. But I, it's he, he directed Hardware, which is a really good movie. Hardware actually. is really exceptional, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to get his name. His name is, uh, <laughs> Richard Stanley. That's the guy. So yeah, Richard Stanley directed color out of space. He was there. He did Q and a, he presented it. And, and I don't know if part of it was because there was the excitement around after 
seeing it on this big screen with the director and all that. I haven't gone back to revisit it, but I walked away from it feeling like my brain had, had been brutalized in the best way possible. Cool. It got a lot of Lovecraft stuff in it. It's got a lot of modern horror stuff in it, some extra stuff in it. And cage does go full cage at one point, <laughs> but, uh, I really liked it, so I'd be real curious to hear what you think about it. And listeners, if you've seen it, I'd like to hear your thoughts, too. I know it's outside of our wheelhouse. It's like a new movie, but yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts. No, I'm really looking forward to it. And the only reason I didn't watch it the other night was because I ended up watching the movie that we're actually going to talk about. Listen, listen to you try to bring us back on track. This is my show. I wanna, No, I'm just kidding. It's fine. <laughs> and, and if we're talking we need about Color Out of Space, I should point out that the, there's a German version that's very good, too. Oh, I cannot pronounce it. Die Farb? Die Farb? Die Farb or it's, something like that, yeah. Yeah, they, I saw that at the Lovecraft Film Festival, too, and it's so good. The way they handle the color is excellent. There's actually another one, too, that's on a... I don't remember the name of it. It's on a, one of these eight movie collections that I got, and it was shot in Spain or Italy or somewhere like that. And it's it's you know got the thing from space and the well that corrupts the people, but it's clearly color out of space without actually being color out of space. It's, maybe right. it's called like the space or something. Maybe I don't know. I don't remember. But there there are a number of these, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the Nick Cage one. Uh, it's still on. The, it's still right there at the top of the pile, along with now that you've mentioned this, the HP Lovecraft Film Festival collection from 2018, I think. Yep. Uh, yep. Which I watched one of, which uh, one of the many little films on it, and it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. We we love some Lovecraft, and clearly Derek and I could probably talk about Lovecraft for just this entire podcast. We, we should do a Color Out of Space episode, because, I mean, it starts with Die, Monster, Die, right? It's the first yes. adaptation. The movie that you're referring to, uh, it's 2008's film Color from the Dark by Ivan Zukon. Yes, I believe that's Who's done it. a couple of different... Uh, Lovecraft adaptations over in Italy, and I believe Debbie Rashone's in that. There's also a film from 87 starring, of all people, Will Wheaton, called The Curse, that is supposedly based on that. <laughs> but yeah, then there's Die Farb, which is fantastic, uh, which is just the color in German. Right. And then uh, the, the, the Nick Cage one. new film with I'm Cage. I'm totally, uh, not having seen the Will Wheaton one, if you want to do this sometime, I'm totally oh, down with doing boy, this. Well, I don't know, man. It's, oof. See what the See what the viewers say. See what the listeners say. If the listeners Ugh. want this, Derek and I will consider it. Because wow. it'd be cool. <laughs> you know, this could actually turn into something. Yeah, you, depending you on probably, what you, happens with. You could even do a whole month of that if you wanted to. Probably. Well, I don't know about a month, but there is a, uh, you know, with the Lovecraft Film Festival, if they go digital again this year, virtual as opposed to a live event, depending on what's going on, I wonder if. This might make an interesting panel. It could pitch with Steve and I talking about these films. I'm, I'm Stay tuned. Stay tuned, <laughs> listeners. Hey, let's talk about supernatural. But until then, we we got the other film from the pile that I picked over the Lovecraft, and you know that I must have had high anticipation for this film if I'm picking it over a Lovecraft film because I'm such a big Lovecraft fan. And We've been going for like 40 minutes and we haven't even talked about this movie. We Let's did, talk about we did this. right at the start and then we did the classic five. So we, what we haven't done is we haven't talked about the plot at all. It's pretty short and sweet and I, I try to get away from doing a lot of like beat by beat breakdowns, but uh, this one I think is one that's a little more off the beaten path for folks so I don't mind getting a little too into the setup. We start with a, uh, a woman who's a serial killer who is uh, she's an artist and she's also killing her lovers which is this is a pre-code film so it's a little racier than you might expect in some ways from a, a film of the sun and to have a woman serial killer portrayed at all in 1933 yeah it's, it's kind of out there and, wow and it's and they uh, the headlines are like kills her lovers Right, and even that kind of thought <laughs> is you you wouldn't get that in 1940, but you are getting that here. So she's killed these people. She's in jail. There's a a doctor who I'm not going to remember uh, what his name is, who comes to believe that that the reason that you get copycat killings after a serial killer kills people is not because people see it and copy it, but because there's some kind of spirit that lives in these serial killers that then possesses other people and compels them to commit the same crimes. 
right? So that's a weird idea to begin with. And this is a very respectable, <laughs> this is a, you know, a, a super respectable doctor. Uh, uh, it's doctor. I just had his name, Dr. Houston played by HB Warner. And I love this guy in this film, by the way, I thought he was great. Yeah, no, But when he does say this, <laughs> nobody bats an eye. Right. It's like, Oh, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I understand. Sure. Right. Yeah, it's it's like uh, some film you were talking about recently was like ghosts. Sure, everyone knows there are ghosts. So, right. So, <laughs> no one, no one bats an eye. It's like he's talking to the ward. So she's going to be killed, and the doctor wants to take possession of her body in order to experiment upon her body and keep her spirit from inhabiting anyone else and carrying on these murders and she's a strangler and one of the things we get to see uh which i was surprised the uh i watched this twice i watched it initially and then i watched it with commentary the commentary had a lot of background on everything but it didn't actually talk that much about what was going on on screen so there's a scene that i thought was really key where we see the woman in prison she's agreeing to let the doctor experiment on her once she's dead. But we see she's got a tin cup uh-huh. in her hand. And we see that she just crushes this tin cup. And this is not like crushing a Coke can would be today. Her crushing this tin cup shows, you know, that strangler grip she has, that she has great strength in her hands. At the same time, the twin of Carol Lombard character dies in some kind of an accident. She and and her brother, they're rich. Her brother has died in some kind of an accident. I don't remember what. And he's in a funeral home. This mysterious gentleman comes in to the funeral home and is, mixes something. And we can't see what he's doing to the corpse of this this man, but... It turns out that this guy that we see breaking into the funeral home and desecrating the corpse, though we don't really see that, we it's like, what's he doing? He's not doing something he should be doing, is a, a fake spiritualist medium, which I would argue they all are. He's a, no. And he has decided that he is going to get Carol Lombard. She plays a character named Roma Courtney. He's going to get Roma's money by pretending to channel and be in touch with her dead brother. Uh, Randolph Scott is uh, Grant Wilson, her boyfriend, playing Randolph Scott, man. <laughs> he's being Randolph Scott. He, he's awesome in it, though. Oh, he's great. great. He, uh, Randolph Scott's a great and leading man. I'm sure all of you uh, probably know him from Westerns and stuff. He was uh, One of his last films was uh, Ride the High Country, I think. He's a, br- he's a really good actor, very sc- square jawed actor it's always interesting when you see him in something where he's a little bit disreputable like ride the high country a- anyway he's <laughs> yeah. he's terrific and everyone that's ever seen blazing sandals knows randolph scott from the moment where cleavon little says you do it for randolph scott and the crowd <laughs> all gasps and goes randolph scott and then the little chorus goes randolph scott <laughs> He's in this film. (laughs) (laughs) So she and her boyfriend go to the spiritualist who is now using that to create fake spook effects to convince her that the guy managing her estate, who's kind of a a very strange, (laughs) kind of interesting, eccentric character, has actually killed her brother. And therefore, somehow, she should trust the spiritualist, and the spiritualist is going to use this to get money from her. So we've got this whole dynamic set up. Also, coincidentally, the guy that's experimenting upon the body of the murderess, Ruth Rogan, is her doctor. <laughs> <laughs> just go with this. It, these, it, it all works in sequence. You just have to accept these kind of things in movies from the 30s and 40s. Sure. (laughs) For various reasons, she shows up at the doctor's house just as the doctor is experimenting with the body. Exactly what the doctor didn't want to have happen. Anyone being around while he basically tries to exorcise the spirit of the dead woman so that no one else will ever be possessed by this murderous spirit. She arrives. Her involvement with the spiritualist becomes creepier and creepier, and it leads to some really interesting 
conclusions in the film. Yeah, I might actually go back and, I mean, I didn't want to interrupt you, see, but I might actually go back and trim some of that out even because I want to leave coming to the mystery to this open still because, man, I really dug this film. I, mean, I didn't have a problem with any of the performers in here, really. I thought everybody was acted great. Even the kind of sort of comic relief dude, William Farnham as Hammond. Right. He was great, too. Yeah, no, he's really interesting. He reminded me of, um, oh, God, the guy that used to do the Robert Benchley, the guy yeah. that used to do the shorts. He's playing kind of a ro- – if Robert Benchley were your <laughs> your financial advisor, <laughs> that's the character he's playing. <laughs> and it's, there were, it's great performances end to end to end on this. And one of the things mm-hmm. that the commentary seemed to say was that the Halpern brothers and uh, the people that financed them in this. And this came right after White Zombie. And the mm-hmm. two of these, what a great double feature that'd make. Oh, that would be really cool, yeah. That they yeah. were hoping, they think, the studio was hoping to cash in on this movie as a female Jekyll and Hyde movie. Ooh, okay, there's another film to put with this as a double feature. Which, wow. Which I hadn't really thought of, but there's even the there's even a scene... A transformation scene where it looks like they probably did that red-green lighting trick that they used in Jekyll and Hyde to actually – you change the lighting on the face, changes her makeup. Yeah, now that I think about it, I, I, you know, I think I know what scene you're talking about. You can almost see it. Yeah, you can actually literally see it. It's like it's a single shot, and her face goes from from uh, either evil to innocent or in, innocent to evil. Yeah. And I won't tell you which because we don't want to ruin the end of the film. <laughs> I think – I think it's easy to look at this and, and, and look at the name Halperin. And granted, White Zombie's great. We love White Zombie. Mm-hmm. It's a phenomenal film. But I think outside of us, <laughs> in the mainstream, it, it is kind of easy to write him off, right? The, right. the Halperin brothers off. I um, mean, they did Revolt of the Zombies. They did Torture Ship. You know, these other movies that didn't really hold up as well as, say, White Zombie. But you look at this and you can see the skill. Yeah, they were talented, super good at what they were doing. They were, and the you know the ironic thing is that they didn't get to do a lot of these kind of a pictures. This you know may have been their first and only one. And I think the commentator on the disc pointed out, and I think he may be right that while White Zombie may be their best, most loved film, this is mm-hmm. probably on almost every way a better film in terms of filmmaking. It's like all of the stuff they brought to White Zombie with a budget. So we get some really interesting the, – the Halpern brothers really did really interesting kind of long takes sometimes. Mm-hmm. In White Zombie, there's that scene in the office with the doctor and the, the young man whose who's, uh, wife, Madeline, has died. It's like a six-minute scene or something like that, and it's one take. Just It starts on the character's back. It pulls back. They talk to each other across the desk. They move around. They do this stuff, and then it goes back to a character's back and fades out. They do a couple of those kind of long takes here where the camera is moving, and they're going, and you're like, this is really cool, and it probably saved them a ton of money <laughs> because it's one camera set up and a bunch of camera moves and then we're out and if you've got good enough actors it's a really cool trick quote unquote and they had more than good enough actors in this uh randolph scott's fantastic carol lombard's amazing uh vivian osborne is the the strangler uh the serial killer woman at the beginning of the film and she's also really good some of the lines that she gives out especially towards the end of her life so desperate about somebody coming to see her and help clear her name and you want to take my body that's all i ever have that's my right that's the only thing i own anymore it's just wow right really good stuff really good stuff and the the fake spiritualist paul bavian played by alan dinehart i liked him too he was a great villain he's a great villain He's a great oh, villain, great. and it's it's always interesting to see that even though this is a, is a story that actually features spirits and ghosts, the spiritualist in this is a complete fraud and gone man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yet, you can see why people would fall for his line, you know, and that was the thing with spiritism and, and mediums and stuff. It's, you can, for all the fact that it it's all just a game to them you can see why people who had lost loved ones would fall for this why the techniques that they Mm -hmm. used would bring people into their sway and into their power 
You know, and if it wasn't for Houdini back around this era, breaking up all the spiritualists and proving that they were frauds, it was headed toward being an entirely new religion based on seances and stuff like that, which is just, oh, man. <laughs> it was a big movement. It was a huge movement back then. Um, and had very, you know, some very prominent people that believed in it, like Arthur Conan Doyle. The guy who created Sherlock Holmes, the man who uses logic and science to figure things out, fell for it. Completely. Yeah, and, and it's, it's amazing. crazy. And, and thank you, Harry Houdini, for... You know, grabbing the cheesecloth and proving the how you tip the tables with your feet and all these other kind of things. And I did some reading about uh, spiritualism yeah. and, and mediumhood in these days after this, too. It was kind of an amazing scene back then. So it's interesting to me that even though this film has supernatural elements in it, and I was so happy that it wasn't ambiguous about that. This is what we're doing. They were committed to this idea. We have a fake, fake medium, but real spirits. <laughs> Which is great. And that's what I was kind of getting at at the beginning of this when I was talking about having like a Tales from the Crypt kind of vibe. You know, it's just EC Comics, a fake guy doing his thing, and the spirits don't like that he's faking it. So let's get him. You know, it's just, <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah, that's a very kind of uh, night gallery. Yeah, too. Yeah, and and I love that. I love that that play on this. Um, but I don't know if I would have loved this movie as much as I did if it wasn't for the performances. I'm going to put it right back down to Carol Lombard. She's amazing. She spends the first part of the movie kind of shell shocked because you know she misses her brother and then this glimmer of hope and wow, just the, the journey she goes through in this film is a, is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. No, she's fabulous. She's one of these people that I. I know from watching a lot of old movies, but I've never, I haven't really followed. And this made me want to go back and, and watch to have and have not and to watch, you know. Yes. A, watch her comedies that she's really well known for. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. I Like I said, I saw, I've seen My Man Godfrey, but I haven't seen very many of other, other films. And now, now I want to go back. And, and just kind of enjoy her filmography. And I don't know if it was in the stream or what. Somewhere I was talking about how it's so awesome, the kind of movies that we're into. Because there's no way any of us, any one of us, have seen all of these classic films, right? There, there's always going to be one or two yep. holes. And it's so great to be able to go back and find a movie like this and to have that first-time discovery feel to it. Right. And, and I can't wait to have that feeling with more of Carol Lombard's films. And, you, and you're going to get to have them, even if they don't have mm -hmm. ghosts and stuff. But yep. finding a film like this that is this good after I've been watching films my entire life, and still there are, there are gems like this out there. How did I never see this before? Well, because it's not, it's not a universal classic. It's not a Hammer classic. Right. It's not one of these films that gets repeated every year. It's not in public domain, so you're not going to run across it like you would White Zombie. Right, and this is yeah. this is probably the Helping Brothers' best film. I I say that without having seen some of their other ones. But what we've seen, though, and we've seen a handful of what we've seen, I think it's probably the I don't want to say the most prestige picture because it is short. It is timed like a B movie, but it it still holds up so well, and it's a lot better than Black Moon. <laughs> <laughs> which which I like, don't get me I wrong. Like I like Moon Black too. Moon alone. But it, it's not Black Moon, and it's not the clairvoyant either. <laughs> it's not. I think it's better than either. I think it's better than either. I, I think you're right about that. In terms of, to use your word, prestige picture, it's a more prestige picture than White Zombie. And in White Zombie, sure. we've got Bela basically mm -hmm. carrying the film. It's not that the other actors and actresses are bad in White Zombie. No, but... A lot of them were from the silent era, and they were used to acting that way, right? Right. So it's a little bit different. But they even use some of the white zombie tricks in this film with the close-up of the eyes. They do. They do. And it's great. Oh, yeah, and that was uh, so one of the, the guy doing the commentary said that that was kind of their trademark that other people then kind of picked up and carried with. I think probably the uh, Boris Karloff mummy did it in a similar time frame. But certainly mm. it helps to mm -hmm. have... You know, two really strong supernatural films sure. from that sure. era doing that as a, as a gimmick. And it, and it really, it works in White Zombie and it works here. The thing about White Zombie, it's a, a really good, fun story. But as a movie, you've got Bela Lugosi 
And even though the other actors are fine, in this movie, you've got Carol Lombard. And if for some reason you're not kind of interested in what she's doing, you've got Alan Dinehart playing the, the villain who is endlessly watchable. Then you've got, mm-hmm. you know, you've got Ruth Ro- the uh, Vivian Osborne playing Ruth Rogan, the, the murderess. She's not on the screen very much, but she's amazing. You've, you've got Randolph Scott to watch. You've got every, every character in this, I think without exception, including the, the guy in the glass blowing shop. They're exceptional. They're exceptional yeah. little characters. They really are. Um, with white zombie, you, especially for us monster kids, you're up against Bela, who is just a, a beacon of charisma. You, you, how do you, how do you stand up to that? In this film, everybody stands up to each other, and it's great. Right. You feel like with all of these characters, unlike with White Zombie, you. Uh, and again, not dissing this because it's a film. It's I, really hard, right? I love, you love that, that film. To write a book but, about it. <laughs> but right. every one of these characters, you feel like they had a life before this story and a and are going somewhere after it. It's like they they all seem more like real people. Whereas the, the sub characters and maybe even Bela to some extent in, in white zombie seems like their story starts and ends with that film. But these guys, yeah, the, yeah. the glass blowing guy after he has his little bit, he's going back to his glass blowing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. The, the doctor, his, his practice is definitely going to change. You, know, there's, <laughs> you feel like these people had, they had lives before and they had lives after and I, after. And I think that's because of the production values. And sometimes, you know, this, the studio, maybe the Halpern brothers wanted the same gal from white zombie to play the Lombard part, but the studio wanted Lombard. And honestly, it was a great choice. Good, good going studio. You put some of your A-listers into this film and it shows. So it's, it's an overwhelming thumbs up. Got to see five out of five. I mean, if, if you got to see this movie, yeah, um, I got it on Blu-ray, it, and I don't have it on Blu-ray, but it's on my wish list. <laughs> <laughs> I I need to get it on Blu-ray. Sounds like I, I this one I'm going to go back to and watch over and over again. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have listeners, a lot of, man. Doesn't have a lot of features. Uh, it's got some. It's got a commentary. I'll trailers, and it's got a commentary that has a lot of Hollywood insider kind of backstory to it. I'm all over that. I'm all over. Yeah, that. I would have. I prefer. Uh, in my commentaries, not to be too snobbish about this, I prefer a mix of kind of backstory commentary along with commentary on what we're seeing on screen. Sure, sure. You know? But I still love the history of Hollywood stuff too. So. Right. I, well, I do too. Uh, you know. Well, this is a great film. Uh, we, we've, I think we've spent more time talking about it than the running length of the film itself. Uh, that, <laughs> but that's true. okay. I mean, it's something that I think people are going to be able to watch and talk about and rewatch and rewatch and that sort of thing. So really a highly recommended film. Uh, we both really loved it. I'm so glad that I mixed it up with black moon. So I got that first time watch experience. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes for people to go buy it for themselves. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. Buy it, buy it, watch, watch more Carol Lombard movies. Yeah. There you go. Uh, it's a terrific movie and a great, there you first- go. Great first time discovery for both of us. All right. So I said it at the beginning. I'm going to say it again. SDSullivan.com. Go check out Steve. See what he's up to. Uh, see uh, all the, the amazing stuff flowing out of his pen and his keyboard. And, and support him if you can. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just, support yeah. support Derek. And uh, often on Saturdays and Tuesdays, we're at MonsterKidMovie.club talking about films and watching some cool films. Sounds good to me. Me too. Thanks for making it to the end of the show. Thanks for sticking around to the end. You know what? Just thank you for everything you've done for the show. Whether you are a first time listener, whether you've been here from the very beginning, thank you for just being part of the monster kid radio audience. Thank you for spreading the word about the podcast, for retweeting tweets and sharing posts on Facebook, for giving us honest reviews, wherever it is you download podcasts these days. I don't know if the iTunes store is really even a thing anymore, but whatever, however you support the show, I thank you. It means a lot. Now, you can learn everything you need to know about Monster Kid Radio over at our website at monsterkidradio.net. There you're going to find links to our Facebook page and our Facebook group, our Twitter, and our contact information. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at 503-810-5MKR. That's 
5657. Or you can send an email to the podcast. MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com is the email address. That's monsterkidradio at gmail.com. Of course, I've got links to where you can follow up with Mark Matsky online and links to where you can get a hold of Steve as well. And his book, Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors, there's a link for you to pick that up as well. And if you use that link, it's an Amazon affiliate link and it helps out the show a little bit. In fact, if you're going to do any shopping on Amazon, please consider using one of those Amazon affiliate buttons that I've got on our website. You don't have to buy what you've clicked through to. The bottom line is if you use that link, you're in the Amazon ecosystem at that point under my affiliate. So any shopping you've got to do on Amazon, if you use that link, I get a little bit of scratch and you've helped to continue this show, making it possible. All that. I got a little garbled there at the end, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, thank you so much for considering doing that. It, it's just, it's awesome. Um, the amount of support that I've gotten over the years uh, to keep this going and to keep the Monster Kid Radio Twitch channel going. It's been mind-blowing. We are coming up on almost a year, if we haven't already surpassed it, because I kind of lose track sometimes, of doing the Monster Kid Movie Club on Saturday on Twitch, where we stream nothing but monster movies for at least seven, eight hours all day long for free with a live chat, with break-ins from me, with live rounds of the Classic Five, and sometimes... <gasps> I even remember to breathe. <laughs> what we've got coming up in the stream. Let's see. Let's do this in reverse order. On Saturday, starting at 11 a.m. Pacific, we're going to have the pre-show. And then at noon Pacific, we're going to kick it off with a whole bunch of haunted house movies. I'm still putting together the stream, still curating a couple of flicks here and there. I can tell you we're going to have a cartoon, a little short cartoon before one of the films. We're going to have some feature films. I got a short movie that I stumbled across online that I think is kind of neat. We're going to be showing that as well. So yeah, we've got some really cool movies lined up for this Saturday with the Haunted House movie edition of the Monster Kid Movie Club. Now, after that, and I know I said I was going to do this in reverse order, but really I just kind of forgot how time works here for a second. After that, on Tuesday is the Monster Kid Astronomy Club, where we show a couple of science fiction films. It's a smaller commitment. It's a smaller event but it's still jam-packed with monster movies, with science fiction monster movies this time. 3.30 p.m. Pacific, we do the pre-show. 4 o'clock Pacific, we do the movies. And then later on that night, usually around 8 o'clock, sometimes a little bit sooner, sometimes a little bit later, depending on how long the movies are, we do a live Star Trek chat with friend of the show, Jeff Pollier. It's a blast. We used to call it the Star Trek 30. I think I still call it the Star Trek 30, but the truth is we always talk for more than 30 minutes about Star Trek, because how can you cut yourself off after. I mean, it's Star Trek. Come on. Anyway, that's free too. And also a live chat. You can find out more about this by going to twitch.tv slash monster kid radio or monster kid movie dot club. And yeah, there are links in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. You're also going to be able to find out what we're covering next week. If you go over to monsterkidradio.net, but as always, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you now, not that I don't want you to go to the website. I do, but I don't want to make you wait. Next week, we are going to have a friend of the show and fellow podcaster, Count Rigor. He's going to be here to talk about the movie Kingdom of the Spiders. Yeah, with William Shatner. An army of deadly predators searching, destroying anything in their path. He's over at Colby's. He's found another 20 or 30 hills just like the one we burned. Why did they come? What do they want? Spiders in this area have organized themselves into an aggressive army. William Shatner, Tiffany Bowling, your nightmares will never be the same. Kingdom of the Spiders, rated PG, parental guidance suggested. So stay subscribed, stay following this podcast, stay tuned, because next week we're going to be getting into that. And then after that, I don't know. I don't have any other recordings in the bank yet. I, I'll figure something out, though, between now and then. I have at least 14 days to figure it out. You know what? Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Now, I didn't mention this at the top of the show, but the song that you heard at the very beginning is the song Stop, Don't Panic. It's from the album Sun Worshipper from the band The Spiratones. They are a surf band based out of Ulverston, in the UK. You can find out more about them over at thespyratones.bandcamp.com. You can pick up the digital album, Sun Worshipper, 
for seven pounds. Go check him out. Let him know the Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name's Derek M. Cook. I'll talk to everybody next week when I get down with the chat and some spiders and Rigor and who knows what else. Ciao. (laughs) 